Ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, this year and every year at the U.S. Islamic World Forum, uh, we speak of uh, hosting new voices, of hosting uh, voices of a new generation. We speak of hosting uh, the voices of more women, and we have all three in one today. Uh, we're honored uh, to host a special guest uh, uh, to speak to us um, about a subject that is important in this day of the Arab Spring, uh, lessons from dictatorship, building consensus through democracy. Um, let me introduce um, Her Excellency Hina Rabbani Kahar, the Foreign Minister of Pakistan, the youngest, I should say, Foreign Minister of Pakistan ever, and also the first woman uh, Foreign Minister of Pakistan. Um, I don't need to tell this audience uh, how important the Pakistani-American relationship is. Uh, it always has been. It is certainly very important now. Uh, it has overcome many challenges uh, in previous years. It's certainly going through its own challenges, but everyone uh, knows that that relationship is not only important for Pakistan and the United States, it's important globally, it's important certainly for the region, and it certainly is important for U.S. relations with the Muslim world broadly. And we are indeed honored uh, to host today Her Excellency uh, and uh, grateful for you in joining us and taking the time and engaging, uh, which is a wonderful sign of something extremely important for both Pakistanis and Americans, Muslims and Americans, to engage in this time of global challenges and certainly challenges in the relationship. Um, let me just a few, say a few things about Her Excellency, Hina Rabbani Kahar. Uh, she is, as I said, the Foreign Minister of Pakistan, uh, she served as Minister of State for Economic Affairs for three years and Minister of State for Finance and Economic Affairs for two. She served as a member of the National Assembly from 2002 to 2008. Her Excellency is a businesswoman by profession. She served as the Vice Chairperson of the Steering Committee for Studies on National Trade Corridor Strategy and structural transformation. She has been a member of the National Finance Commission, the Economic Advisory Council, the Cabinet Committee on Fast Track Power Generation Projects uh, through international competitive bidding, uh, uh, the Cabinet Committee for Review of Zakat uh, and uh, Bayt al, uh, al Mal system, uh, the Task Force on public-private partnership, infrastructure, finance, and development, and the Young Parliamentarians Forum uh, in Pakistan. She was elected as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum, uh, was the chairperson uh, of uh, the Ahan Rural Development uh, Concern, and served as governor of Pakistan at the Islamic Development Bank. She graduated with a BS in economics from the Hoare University of Management and Sciences and MS in Business Management from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So she obviously also understands America and uh, that relationship uh, between America and Pakistan very well. Your Excellency, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, please uh, come to the stage. And um, uh, uh, Her Excellency agreed to give some uh, We'll take some questions after the presentation, please. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. A very good morning and assalamu alaikum to everyone. Uh, respected guests, learned scholars, friends, and some, though very few, countrymen uh, in today's gathering. First of all, let me say it's a pleasure for, to, for me to be in Doha today. And I want to begin by thanking the Brookings Institution for first of all extending this invitation, giving such a kind introduction, and uh, most importantly for hosting what we consider to be an extremely important annual forum. Any effort that helps stimulate a deeper and more reflective conversation between the Muslim world and the United States 
is one that I am, as the Foreign Minister of Pakistan, fully supportive of, and one that the Pakistan government certainly fully appreciates and encourages further. I also want to take a moment to appreciate and thank the state of Qatar and the leadership and vision of His Highness, the Emir of Qatar, Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa Al Thani, Qatar's emergence as one of the Muslim world's leading centers for intellectual capital is no small achievement. For this, we must also thank Her Highness, uh, Sheikha Moza, and the tireless work of the Prime Minister. Hamad bin Jassim bin Jabbar Al Thani has also been instrumental in Qatar becoming a place where important conversations about the Muslim world's past, its present, and its future are taking place. And not just here at the Ritz-Carlton, but all across Doha's many, many centers of academic excellence. Now, the kind of reflective exercise is something that is very apt at this juncture where we're standing today. After September 11, there was initially some real hope that we would begin to reach deeper than the surface to explore more about the dynamic between the Muslim world and the West, and the United States in particular. However, a number of factors prevented that very deep conversation from really actually ever taking place. Now, as we evaluate the impact of the Arab Spring and try to understand what countries like Egypt are going through, there is once more a real opportunity to understand the dynamic between the Muslim world and the US. This time, the context, luckily, is democratic transition and democratic evolution. I believe that Pakistan, too, has a lot to offer in this regard. We've gone through the Pakistani spring all the way back in 2007, when civil society, the media, and mass political parties came together, all together, to bring about the end of a military regime in Pakistan. It is a journey that is still going on in some ways, and it is the journey which does leave a few marks. Now let me first of all begin from a personal perspective. Within this setting, being a Muslim woman from Pakistan is in some ways a rich starting point for any discussion. But being the foreign minister and being rel relatively young, though I can promise you I have aged enormously in the last few months only. And then of course being a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister, all of these things help inform my own views about the great challenges that face us in Pakistan. The challenges that face our region, especially in Afghanistan, and the challenges faced by the broader Muslim world. Now, these notions aren't an academic exercise. We have to contend with intensely difficult issues in our own separate spaces, whether you're a diplomat or a journalist or an academic. We also have to contend with the complexity of being interlinked and interdependent all the time. I'm often encouraged to talk about what it's like to be a woman foreign minister. You know, that's all I know. I don't exactly have anything to compare with. I never was a man foreign minister. So more importantly, the issue isn't whether a Muslim woman of privilege, as I'm fortunate to be and fortunate to recognize, finds a job more interesting because of her faith or because of her gender. The bigger issue and the more important issue is the quality of representation that I provide regardless of my gender, to women whose lives are influenced in real ways, sometimes tragic ways, by the circumstance of their gender and the mutilated manner in which tribal traditions, some of which are traditions that date back to the Jahalia, are superimposed upon a faith. Recently, a young woman named Fakhra Yunus in Pakistan took her own life after enduring the most horrid acid attack and the unbearable pain of living a disfigured and shambolic life and a life in which attaining justice seemed out of reach for her. I'm not afraid to talk about Fakhra Yunus because if we do not talk about her, we will never get to be rid of the scourge of violent attacks on women, attacks that use acid to disfigure women. A Pakistani, another Pakistani woman, Sharmeen Aboyed Chanoy, who made a documentary on the many nameless Fakhras who go through acid attacks. This story was portrayed, or the stories 
of the many faceless fakhra who go through acid attacks in countries like Pakistan was portrayed alongside the story of the many men and women, all Pakistanis who's, who heroically assist and help these nameless women. Now this woman, Sharmeen Abad Chinoy, who wrote about the same criminal criminality, brought her own country, Pakistan, great pride by being the first Pakistani national man or woman to have ever won Pakistan an Oscar award. It is talking about Fakhras that helped us move in parliament to outlaw this horrid practice. And just this past year, we have criminalized the use of such violence in an unprecedented way. We, do, we did this through an act of parliament, ladies and gentlemen, and this is what I'm here today to talk about, Pakistani democracy. It has taken a long time for us to outlaw many things, including acid attacks. This is true. And it has taken a long time to fix some other things too. Democracy does take time. I want to talk through some of these things, including, you will be happy to learn, the Pakistan-US relationship also. Now, since the martial law in July of 1977, Pakistan's constitution experienced repeated maiming and mutilation at the hands of first General Ziaul Haq and later General Pervez Musharraf. The purpose of these dictators in altering the constitution was to service the project of undiluted, unchallenged, and unmitigated power in the offices of the dictators. Now, nothing as dramatic as that comes without a cost for a nation. The cost of the centralization of power in the hands of the authoritarian military leaders for Pakistan has been extremely high. The irrational and toxic infusion of Pakistan's politics with reactionary and regressive people who claim to be Islamic in orientation is just one of the legacies of the mutilation of Pakistan's constitution. The legacy at, has been nurtured under every dictatorship in Pakistan. The secretive and transactional relationship with the United States happens to be another. During dictatorships, Pakistan has been an a la carte partner of the US. As we all know, democracy is more of a buffet. Uh, sometimes the food that we really crave is not part of the buffet at all. Now, there have been other casualties of the militarized and altered constitution too. We are failing to provide our children the education that they deserve, largely because in the hands of dictators, the state is an instrument of perpetuating power, not an instrument of delivery to those that need it most. In the consensus constitutional amendments which were recently passed in Pakistan, under the new democratic setup, we have now made free education to all, boys and girls, the responsibility of the state of Pakistan to provide. Perhaps most of all, ladies and gentlemen, under dictators, we have been forced to take a series of poor decisions whose implications could not possibly have been thought through very well, by virtue of them being having been taken by individuals rather than a collective of representatives rather than the collective wisdom. The strategic reality governing Pakistan today is embedded and encumbered by this historical and political reality that I talked of. Elected leaders have a responsibility to represent and serve the interests of the people that elect them. Since Pakistan is a diverse country, this means that decisions in a democratic Pakistan can only be arrived after a lot of compromise and mostly after a lot of time. Now let's give you a bit of a historic perspective. When the Pakistan People's Party and the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, which is today, by the way, the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz or PMLN, uh, today our chief opposition party in parliament, were being hounded by General Musharraf, the two arrived at that time at the unmistakable consensus that returning the constitution to its original form, restoring the powers of the parliament, and the people of Pakistan and ensuring decentralized and autonomous federating units is the only way, the only real way to ensure that the decisions Pakistan takes are reflective of the largest and the most representative common denominator. That spirit is what helped create the Charter of Democracy across the spectrum of political parties all the way back in 2006. 
That charter is part of the rich legacy bequeathed to us by Shaheed Mohtarama Benazir Bhutto. It is a covenant that we have lived up to so far. Since coming to power with the cooperation of opposition parties and especially parliamentary and coalition partners and allies, we have restored the constitution and we have freed the provinces from the domineering instinct of the central government which lasted for decades in Pakistan. We have re-energized and reinvigorated parliament and we have done this by passing numerous structural amendments to the constitution as well as numerous unanimously agreed pieces of le legislations and resolutions. The concept behind it all has been rather simple and sustained. The more that our decisions and our behavior is owned by the people of Pakistan as represented in parliament, the stronger Pakistan will be, both internally and externally. The 18th, 19th, and the 20th constitutional amendments have been widely celebrated and acknowledged as models of bipartisan national consensus. Pretty impressive for a country which is supposedly constantly on the brink. Well, we are on the brink. We are on the brink of growing into a sustainable, into a real democracy with institutional longevity. And being on the brink naturally, naturally does create ripples. It upsets the order of things as they used to be, and it sometimes creates flux. Now, ladies and gentlemen, after the Salala incident, we took the issue of our engagement with the United States and NATO to parliament. Not because, as some people repeatedly allege, we were unprepared to take the difficult decisions that an executive ought to take, but rather because we were keen to ensure that moving forward, our friendship with the United States would, would, would endure crisis, small and big, at a time of great complication and complexity that we are experiencing as we speak. We did this because, in the ultimate analysis, the big lesson from our experience with dictatorships and democracy, our experience of the life and martyrdom of Shaheed Muhtarama Benazir Bhutto, and our collective experience as a people is that building consensus in a diverse context, no matter how difficult, is a prerequisite to dealing credibly with the really big, important issues. Pakistan values its relationship with the US far too much for it not to be among the really big, important issues. And because it is a big issue and an important issue, we need national consensus on it, and we needed national consensus on it. We feel that until a country is able to truly build consensus across ex ethnic, linguistic, cultural, and political lines on important issues of national interest, both domestic and international, it cannot interact within the international sphere with the strength and clarity that is necessary. Having gone through the transition to a fully functional democracy today, we are confident that parliamentary processes are the sound of Pakistan speaking with one voice. When it comes to Pakistan-US relations, this voice has spoken, and it has spoken clearly. We need to listen to it carefully, because beyond the headline-grabbing stuff that excites beat reporters, there is real substance for us to consider here. The parliamentary process for assessing our engagement with the US offers both Pakistan and our friends in the US some real great opportunities. We cannot afford, ladies and gentlemen, in my view, to lose this unprecedented opportunity which is at our doorstep. The parliamentary process represents the collective wisdom of almost 200 million people. The guidelines offer a framework for us to move forward in a spirit of friendship and partnership with the US, but to ensure that our pursuit is of mutual interest in an environment of mutual respect. There is broad consensus in Pakistan to develop ties with the US within this given framework. Ladies and gentlemen, we continue to work with our American friends and to explain to them that it's at this important juncture it is important that the message that the ordinary Pakistani on the streets, in the urban, in the rural areas of Pakistan gets is that the United States values democracy in Pakistan 
and that the United States respects the one voice of consensus that the Pakistani nation has spoken with. Indeed, we appreciate very much the reassurances that we've been provided that this is indeed the case from the United States side. Ladies and gentlemen, the issue of the apology is still latent. We lost 24 of our soldiers. They, these are brave young men that help protect us. Almost 6,000 of their colleagues in the military and paramilitary forces have laid down their lives fighting against militants and extremists, including Al-Qaeda, inside Pakistani territory. Parliament has articulated the sentiments of the country in expressing a desire for an apology. I believe it is not unreasonable to expect one. Ladies and gentlemen, Parliament has also articulated the need for counter-terrorism tools that are acceptable to the Pakistani people and that are not counterproductive and that do not act as fodder, as fodder for extremist recruitment. This is also not unreasonable. We want to be able to tell our people that we and our American friends are jointly committed to work towards using counter-terrorism tools that are more acceptable and more effective in the long run. Parliament has asked that there should be guarantees that Salala-type incidents do not recur. This too is not unreasonable. We want to be able to demonstrate to our people that our American friends are receptive to this. Perhaps most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, if you read the parliamentary recommendations on the terms of engagement with US-NATO that were unanimously adopted recently, Parliament has unequivocally called for all foreign fighters within Pakistani territory to be expelled and that Pakistani soil must not and should not be allowed to be used against any other country. This is wholly reasonable for Pakistanis as these foreign fighters have been attacking us incessantly. We would never wish for others to, have to endure what we have withstood as a nation. The wisdom and resolve that this part of the Parliament's articulation represents is the peaceful existence that we, as Pakistanis, want to or wish to or hope to pursue. But ladies and gentlemen, none of these things will mean very much if we are not able to create an enabling environment to move forward. Moving forward obviously means to work on the convergences and to work through the divergences. It means to remember that we are here to win the war against extremism in all its forms and manifestations and not to fall victim to it. We are in it to win it. And we work through, and as we work through our divergences with our friends in the United States government, we are mindful more than maybe any other country can possibly be that the stakes are greatest maybe for our neighbors, for our Afghan brothers and sisters, and by extension, Therefore, for us. When the sun shines in Kabul, we feel the warmth. When there's darkness and gloom, we feel the pain. This is proven historical, demographic, linguistic, and economic reality for Pakistan. No country wants a stable, peaceful, and prosperous Afghanistan more, uh, Afghanistan more than Pakistan does. Not for reasons of generosity, though we appreciate those also, but simply for reasons of hardcore self interest. This is part of a broad lesson that we have learned from our recent history. It is not something that we take lightly, but it is something that will take time, just like legislating for greater protections for women has in Pakistan and a stronger federal system has in Pakistan. The shifting of strategic habits has taken some time also. And just like the legacy of Shaheed Benazir Bhutto, we are not afraid of the road ahead and we are not daunted by the challenges that we face today. We will forge ahead. Pakistan will be, inshallah, come what may, a friend and a partner to its Afghan brothers and sisters, and a friend and a partner to each and every one well -wish wisher of the Afghans. This is the Pakistani way. We will also continue to play our role as an enabler and as a facilitator for peace and stability within the region within Afghanistan. Sometimes, as we have seen in the last decade, at great cost, at the cost of great sacrifice, at the cost of great loss, some economic, some social, some in thousands of civilian 
lives lost. But we shall persevere because we are convinced that we are sacrificing our today for the dream of a more peaceful, stable tomorrow for the children of the region, for the children of Afghanistan, and for the children of Pakistan. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. For your Well, thank you very much for your thoughts uh, on a wide-ranging set of issues. Um, uh, the very fact that you're here addressing a U.S. Islamic World mm -hmm. Forum uh, shows how important that relationship is to you and engaging it. And so allow me to ask you a question, then we'll open it up to the audience with a few questions. Uh, just to follow up on something you said, mm -hmm. but broaden it a little bit. And, and you have said that the U.S has to show the Pakistani man on the street that we respect Pakistani democracy. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on what you expect exactly the U.S. to do, mm -hmm. uh, particularly. And also, now that uh, you, know, you, you are working diligently to improve and solidify this important relationship, how you identify the core challenges to the relationship today? Uh, with you as, as a foreign minister of Pakistan uh, uh, spending time on consolidating their relationship, how do you uh, uh, see the priorities uh, and the challenges today? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, first of all, uh, maybe I'll take a few steps back and talk about what you said I referred to, which is the impression or the message that you want to give to the Pakistani people. Uh, and the messaging is, of course, important in building a long-term relationship. And as I explained, that was the reason why we thought it was important for the parliament to take ownership of the future of this engagement. But it is not a, an unknown fact, and it is a widely spread or a widely believed notion, all around Pakistan at least, I don't know anywhere else, that typically it is dictatorships in Pakistan which have had more support from the United States than democracies in Pakistan. And if you look all the various elements uh, or the, you know, the matrix on which you want to look at, whether it's uh, potential economic, uh, financial assistance, whether it is political, diplomatic support where, you know, dictatorial regimes which were sometimes on the brink of being rejected by the Pakistani people got a new wave of life because they were being supported elsewhere. So now the, if this is a view which is typically there and now you don't want that view to be reinforced by a solidification of democracy as it is happening, as I articulated, through the various constitutional changes, it is today clear that the real structural flaws in Pakistan's systems have already been corrected. And it is that which is creating the ripples in Pakistan today, which look to the ordinary eye, uh, you know, or I would say the less sophisticated observer, as on the brink again. To us, it is not on the brink. To us, it is correcting the wrongs which were made in history. Now, we know that in every relationship, there are certain terms uh, you know, of engagement, etc. Now, the Salala incident weighed very heavily on the Pakistani psyche and on the Pakistani people, because here was 24 of our soldiers, that I, as I explained, who lost their lives to what was friendly fire, coming in from, a con you know, from uh, where we have been assisting at great cost to ourselves. You know the, that Pakistani nation has lost among, you know, about 30,000 civilians, 6,000 soldiers to our fight against extremism, uh, against militancy within the region, within Pakistan. Now, when the parliament looked at the whole situation, the parliament asked for four or five simple things in some ways. One of them, I'll just give you one example, otherwise I will give in, go too much into a soliloquy mode, for instance. One of them, for instance, was an apology for the loss of life. Now, we would consider it to be natural, to be a natural reaction, even if it was accidental that we are, we are all, we all should be sorry for the loss of life, for the unnecessary loss of life. And we should all be able to, you know, uh, sort of respond to that. So the message that you send, if, for instance, the parliament representing 180 million people of Pakistan has said that we would encourage you to, you know, say, to apologize for the loss of life, uh, and the, the, so what's the message that you want to send? That you do care about the aspirations of the people of Pakistan. Now, that is a very, very simple thing. 
Otherwise, within the parliamentary recommendations, the real spirit is, first of all, why I think the parliamentary recommendations is such a big opportunity and why it offers today an unprecedented opportunity because it is widely believed that the vast majority of Pakistanis are anti-US, that they're anti-pursuing a path of friendship, of partnership with the West, with the United States. Now, the parliamentary recommendations have proven that that is not the case because a consensus document which is emerging from a joint session of the parliament says, please pursue a track of friendship, of partnership to pursue our joint goals and objectives with the United States of America and with other NATO countries. But please do so within the realm of mutual respect, pursuing mutual interest, and to be seen to not using tools which are seen to be counterproductive to Pakistan's uh, needs and requirements and Pakistan's future, uh, Pakistan's future in some ways. So all in all, I think we have a real unprecedented opportunity. Uh, we feel that we are clearly moving towards doing our part in it. And we are, of course, interacting with the United States in hopes, hope that we will together be able to take this opportunity to make good of it. Well, thank you very much. We'll open it up um, to questions. Uh, and please uh, identify yourself when you ask that question. Yes, please. Uh, wait for the microphone. which. First of all, thank you very much uh, for your uh, uh, comments and feedback uh, on Pakistan. I am going to ask a very poignant please question. Please identify yourself. Oh, sorry. I'm Rehan Dower from Washington, D.C., Ethica Global Alliance. Uh, uh, a poignant question is related uh, directly to Pakistan's current condition, given the conflicts that's going on. Um, and there's a lot of conversation about the potential of civil war. Um, and the question is, how can Pakistan today avoid this real threat of a civil war that threatens not only, of course, the internal uh, civilization itself, but the issue of uh, uh, your uh, nuclear weapon, as well as uh, the interest in Gwadar, uh, the warm water port, and of course, the conflict between in, in Kashmir. How, is, how can we look at Pakistan addressing this real potential threat of civil war? Okay. I must admit, I'm being slightly confused on uh, uh, okay, the threat of civil war, in some ways, Pakistan being on the brink, sort of a view, right? Now, as I said, I feel that many things uh, which were structural changes, negative structural changes, which had taken place in Pakistan, through, the, through maiming the Pakistani constitution, have been corrected. And let me give you two examples. The share of the provinces within the overall pie, or what their responsibility was and what the resources was. In the last three years, the share of the provinces have almost been doubled through a National Finance Commission, which we were unable to achieve in 26 years. Then the constitutional changes which have given powers back to the provinces through the 18th Amendment ensure that the provinces are in the driving seat of their own destiny. And the federating unit structure, which was in initially envisioned in Pakistan, is back in place. So this will take care of many of the issues which you refer to, which have you know, provincialism in their nature. Now, then you talked about the nuclear weapons, which is, uh, of course, under a very strong uh, national control and command authority, which is chaired by the prime minister. And we have absolutely uh, no qualms about it. And I think that is something which is uh, clearly unnecessarily dealt upon mostly in many, many press. On the Gwadar port itself, now we consider Gwadar port to be a great asset in Pakistan. So what I'm saying is that some of the things that you mentioned are considered to be assets in Pakistan. But the real problems were in the structural transformation or the changes which were required to be done constitutionally, which had taken away the real structure of governance in Pakistan. So that structure of governance is back in action through the 18th Amendment of the Constitution. Now, of course, something which was done away with for 40 years is not going to correct itself immediately in the next four years. So the correction in some ways has started, and we hope that these changes will bring about the real change. But to be quite honest, I mean, we've been talking about a potential civil war in Pakistan for maybe longer than the years that I am, you know? So we have to look at 
the real uh, transformation which is taking place in Pakistan, we feel that this is a positive transformation. We feel that a lot of this talk about the elbowing between institutions, etc., is signs of real uh, positive change taking place in Pakistan and every institution finding its rightful place. And whereas some institutions have had a larger than life role, others a smaller than constitutionally given role, then when the smaller than constitutionally role is going to grow into its rightful place, then the larger than life roles is, are going to be contracted. So all of this is going to create some real ripples, which we are experiencing right now. But the fact, I'll give you a simple example. The fact that political parties in Pakistan, even today, have been fighting with each other on many, many issues, both inside parliament and outside of parliament, but have come together not once, but thrice to give three unanimous constitutional amendments which before only were possible during dictatorial regimes in Pakistan has a lot to say about maturity of the political system and about the will to believe or to contribute towards national consensus. Thank you, Martin. First of all, I wanted to, uh, I'm Martin Indyk, the uh, uh, director of the foreign policy program at the Brookings Institution. I, I wanted to uh, express my appreciation and, and I imagine that I can speak on behalf of everybody here at uh, the courage uh, which you've shown, not only in your presentation today, but in the stand that you've taken on behalf of women's rights. Uh, and the protection of, of women in uh, your country, Pakistan. And I really think that that deserves uh, a, a great deal of uh, support and applause. Uh, in terms of the US-Pakistan uh, relationship, I also um, highly appreciate your emphasis on the role of parliamentary democracy in Pakistan because it, it gets little attention in the United States and I think that that's a very important message. But the reason it gets little attention in the United States is because of the perhaps easy assumption, although I think there's reason for it, that um, it's the military that has the dominant say in Pakistan, and particularly in terms of the US-Pakistani relationship. I dare say that the reason that an apology is not yet forthcoming is because of the feeling that the military uh, played a role in the attack which, which uh, resulted in the uh, uh, response that unfortunately killed Pakistani soldiers. Um, there's, a, uh, I think, a, a strong belief in the United States, in Washington in particular, that the role that some elements of the Pakistani military played in, in, in the harboring of Osama bin Laden for so many years is something that, that has not yet been accounted for either. So. I think that, that obviously each side has its own uh, uh, complaints about the other, uh, but in terms of your efforts to move beyond this, mm -hmm. I think it would be useful to hear how um, the democratically elected uh, representatives of Pakistan are going to deal with the relationship with the Pakistani military. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I think you asked very pertinent questions because uh, you refer to the many concerns uh, about Pakistan which do the rounds and what I consider to be in some ways also misperceptions about where Pakistan is today. Because in some ways when we talk about where Pakistan is today or what system is in play in Pakistan, I think we have a huge historical hangover of the fact that Pakistan, out of the 60 plus years of its history, spent 30 plus years under dictatorial regimes. And that is a real thing that is there. So that hangover persists as we speak. But again, I may want to ask the question at the very outset that which deserves or which system deserves more support? Uh, and what we have seen historically, I hope that's not what the future is going to say, but what we've seen historically, typically, is that the two regimes which got the most support from the United States of America happened to be those of both dictators, or maybe the third one also I could include. Now, what we have also seen historically that the regimes which have uh, sort of, uh, you know, attracted the most censures 
or uh, even sanctions are mostly the democratic regimes. So it is, the question might be asked, what is encouraging what, or who is encouraging what? But let's not get into that argument. Uh, where we are today, from the Pakistani perspective, there is a parliament in place, an active parliament, which has taken its rightful place within Pakistan. Uh, this particular <coughs> set of recommendations or resolution which came from the parliament on the re-engagement with the United States and NATO, why do I call it unprecedented? It is true that it, is never bef it, that it, is, it has been many times before in Pakistan's history that the foreign policy of Pakistan has been discussed in the parliament. That was not what was unprecedented. What was unprecedented in some ways was that your relations with the United States, with NATO countries, were almost put on hold while the parliament gave a final verdict on it. Now, the final verdict that came was a very positive verdict. The final verdict that came was that of engagement, but on terms which were respectful of each other's sovereignty, of each other's independence, of each other's territorial integrity, of each other's people's aspirations. So here was a moment to see it. In my view, in my humble view, here is a moment to seize that you want to correct many wrongs, some that the Pakistani people did to themselves, some that were assisted by other countries, you know, support to regimes which should have, should have never gotten a great deal of support. But, and as far as the talk about the military's dominant role is concerned, let's be clear on that. Constitutionally, the military's role in foreign policy is not there. But as I said, there's a hangover in the perception because of the fact that for 36 odd years or so, there was a military dictatorship in the country and therefore we are used to dealing with dictators. Now, the other fact is that the military has, however, is a real stakeholder when it comes to security concerns or security input to the government, but it is to the government, the executive which is, you know, representing the parliament. So this system is in place in Pakistan. It is working as we speak. However, the hangover from the past has a vast shadow that is being overcasted over what Pakistan today is. So it is important that as we move forward, we all move in ways which is to demonstrate what is the future that Pakistan is pursuing rather than the past that Pakistan brings to the table. You know, our commitment is to the future of Pakistan. And within that, you also mentioned, I would just like, you know, maybe want to just uh, deal with that question also about uh, the possibility of the military harboring OBL. It is through the American intelligence which was taken from the OBL compound itself now that they have largely reached the conclusion that there was no military intelligence or government support. Now, as much as it was a surprise to the rest of the world, believe me, it was as much of a surprise to Pakistan also. And the parliament session, another joint session of parliament which was called after the OBL raid in Pakistan talked about the same issues and the same concerns that you talk about. So we all collectively have in some ways the same concerns. But what I'm saying is that not our intelligence, but it is the US intelligence which has proven that there was no complicity in this particular matter. And now it is, of course, a huge challenge that these things occur in Pakistan. It is a challenge to us and it is a challenge to everyone. How do we deal with that challenge? Do we deal with that challenge by, you know, telling each other what we're doing wrong? Or do we deal with that challenge by collecting our energy together, by charting out a way forward in which all of our energies are pursuing the same direction rather than pursuing different directions? Because clearly, I'm convinced, as the Foreign Minister of Pakistan, that the stated objective of the United States, if that is peace and stability within the region, then our objective is not and cannot be different. Because we suffer from the lack of peace and stability within the region on a daily basis. We lose our children to it. So we're moving in the right direction. We, as Pakistanis, are convinced. We are suffering both internally and externally in some ways because of that, because there is some correction which is taking place. But we are very confident that the march towards the future is going to be towards a more peaceful, more stable, certainly a democratic, 
And those democratic values, the democratic systems are finding roots like never before. And as I said, you know, the fact that the political parties in Pakistan are coming together to make these transformational constitutional changes which require two-third majority, and a government which is able to do it does not even have, you know, does not even, our majority does not go beyond 50%. So these are all the right movements towards the future of Pakistan. And, but we, I, I sometimes feel, I'm sorry, I have to say this, I sometimes feel that it is not as well recognized, certainly well, not well nurtured, and I don't think we look towards others to nurture it. It is for Pakistanis to nurture it themselves, and they've done a fantastic job about it in the last few years. But to at least to recognize that change, to recognize that that change is truly taking place in Pakistan. Well, thank you very much. I know there are a lot of people who signal they want to ask questions. Unfortunately, Excellency is going to have to go. I only have one final uh, a question. The lady back here is next on my uh, list. I apologize to all the others who will not have the chance to ask the question. Thank you very much. My name is Maretta Bildam I'm from the European Union, and I wanted to salute you, and I thought it was very interesting to hear what you said about these um, attacks on women and the fact that it's now been criminali criminalized by your parliament. Um, I come from a continent where we also have problems of uh, tolerance and respect, whether it's based on gender, race, or religion. One of the things that I uh, sometimes wonder is whether we think we can legislate our way out of these things. Uh, and I sense that there is a problem there. Yesterday we heard from an initiative called Sisters in, Sla in Islam who uh, talked about uh, their experience of saying no to the discrimination perpetrated in the name of Islam. What kind of, um, what kind of uh, role do you think that could have in Pakistan, or do you see a need for that kind of initiative? Okay, uh, first of all, uh, you know, let me just say that Islam gave women its respect. Islam was the first religion to give, it, give it women its respect and its rightful place within society. Now, that respect was given at a time when we were passing through what we call, what is widely known as the Jahalia period, where women, because they were born a girl child, were buried alive, where women were treated as cattle. So if you look at what respect and what honor and what dignity and what rights Islam gave to women at that particular time, and you do a projection from that to now, you should, you know, we should all be, at least I, as a practitioner of Islam, and proud of the place that Islam gives to women, women in society, not only within the religious context, in the house, at the workplace. Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, his first wife was a businesswoman. I mean, how many people, th that's not the Islam that we like to portray, it seems. Uh, the type of Islam that we like to portray is women being subjugated. So it is cultural norms and practices more than religious dictation, which is creating the things, which is, and I, I blame each one of the Muslim societies for that. So I don't blame Islam at all. Islam, on the other hand, gave women its rightful place in society. It is the Muslim societies that I would choose to blame uh, for that, including my own. Now, going forward, you know, in, in, in our view, there, there's a role or there's a place for everything. Legislation has its own value, a huge value, and therefore I'm proud to say that this government has done more legislation for women's rights, for, you know, harassment, legislation against harassment at workplace, ensuring that they get representation within the civil service of Pakistan, families laws. Uh, we are currently looking at domestic violence law, which is currently in parliament being debated vociferously from both sides. Uh, I told you about the acid uh, attack law. Now, all of these are in some ways large, big breakthroughs which have taken place. However, we understand that the demons that we face are typically within society, within the norms of behavior. But what does legislation do? It creates a wall against the woman, a wall of protection. That a person who could previously throw acid at a woman without ever thinking he would have to face serious criminal charges and consequences for it, today will think twice because there will be precedences of the neighbor who did throw acid and got into jail for 10 years. So these are all real, again, very, very, very seldom, um, 
Mark, if I can refer to you, very seldom written about. You know these changes are the positive changes which are occurring in Pakistani society as we speak. Uh, and, but they're not spoken about as much as we would ideally like to. Uh, so we, I, we feel very strongly that we are, as a society, as a Muslim society, we are maturing, we are moving towards uh, giving the woman in the Muslim society the place that Islam gave to it. Thank you very much. Um, before I end, I just want to remind the audience that the uh, uh, strategic change panel will start immediately um, after and uh, uh, this panel ends. Uh, please join me in thanking Her Excellency for coming here and for excellent presentation.